morning, everybody. I would like to welcome you all to the services at Faith Baptist Church in Ludowice, Georgia, on this Sunday morning, April the 26th. Thanks for joining us. We want to say to all of our people, we're praying for you. Hope everybody's doing well in spite of this uh, coronavirus situation. And we're all trying to deal with all the different issues that is presented to us. But in spite of all that, I'm glad through technology we can still get the Word of God out and we can fellowship, worship together as best we can under these circumstances. And hopefully real soon, within the next few weeks, we hope to be back in church together. So I hope you're making your plans, looking forward to it. I'm excited about it. I miss you. And I hope you miss me and hope you miss everybody else. We miss one another when we're not able to fellowship and worship and encourage one another together in church like we ought to. But it's great to be here. I hope you're uh, prepared to hear a message from the Word of God. Be encouraged by songs that will uplift your heart and hopefully get your attention on the things of the Lord, not on all these problems that are going on. We'll start our service today with a song. Brother Kick Lighter is going to come and lead us in a song as we begin. And if you're there at home, please sing along with us. All right, we're going to sing one verse of heaven came down and glory filled my soul. We'll just sing the first verse, and at the end of this good song, Ms. Leah is going to come up and sing for us. It's 510. If you happen to have a, a hymn book there with you, sing it out with me on the first verse. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. As unto the Lord.
Miss Leah, for a beautiful song and a beautiful message as well. All we see now, perhaps, is the valley. And we will look to the Lord Jesus because he knows just what's around the corner. And he will, and we will, be victorious. Amen. Let's pray. Ask God to bless our service today. And I'm at the end of my prayer. Brother PJ is going to come up and sing for us today. And I know as well that that will be a blessing for you. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. We come, Lord, not on our own merit, but on his. Thanking you for the death, the burial, the resurrection, the shed blood, and the victory that is ours today in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, of all of us going through tough spots, but Lord, the truth of the matter is that uh, you have not moved. You're still on the throne. You knew this was coming. You see the beginning, the middle, and you obviously know the end. And Lord, I just pray that you would give us comfort in our hearts and that we'll direct our attention to you, not so much on the areas around us that are not what we would like. And God, though we have to live through it, we can keep our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray that you'd help us to do that. Thank you again for the opportunity to be in your house today and other Lord's Day that we could meet together, that we may be few in number here in the building. Lord, we know that there's a lot of folks watching us and we ask that your blessings would be upon them today. Our preacher is going to come in a few minutes and preach to us, and I ask God that you bless him. And Lord, may the things we do today honor you, speak to our hearts, draw us close to the Lord Jesus, and help us to be more like him. And we'll thank you for it. In Christ's precious name we ask. Amen. Brother PJ.
Thank you, Brother PJ. We appreciate that good song as well. Thank the Lord for these folks that are willing to use their talent for the Lord Jesus Christ and to sing praises. What a great thought. The blind man, he saw it all because he had met the Lord Jesus. Just a couple of quick announcements. I know that the governor's made an announcement maybe, uh, you know, to basically open up some businesses, and I guess we're glad for that. We're able to go back to work some of you, I trust, and we pray that that's true. Um, we'll be making a decision sometime this week about when to exactly start back our church services, and we will let you know that just as soon as we get a, a better determination on when the good time of that would be. You be praying about it, we'll pray about it. We got the new month coming up, the month of May, just around the corner. Matter of fact, next Sunday. And sometime this week, we'll let you know what um, our plans will be. So just remember to keep each other in prayer. If you have any questions, give us a call here at the church. Any needs, again, we want to be sure that if you have any need at home uh, that perhaps we're not aware of, that you'll give us a call. Our phone numbers are on the website. And most of you have those already. So you call us. If you have any physical needs, financial needs, or perhaps more importantly, some spiritual needs, please let us know here. And we will do everything we can to get that back in order. We love you. As the pastor's already said, we miss you. And church just is not the same. I'm glad I'm here, but it is just not the same without you being here with me. I love you. I miss our Sunday school class. I miss the fellowship. And I miss um, seeing all of you. You're a blessing to me. And I look forward to the day that we'll be meeting together here again at Faith Baptist Church. Okay? All right. Before the preacher today, Miss Sellers is going to come and sing a song for us. And I know it will be a blessing to you. What a great thought God will make this trial a blessing. Miss Sellers. <laughs>
What a blessing. What some good songs, I think, to encourage our hearts and lift us up. Take your Bibles this morning for the message. Let's turn it to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 6. And I'd like to put in reading about verse number 19. A lengthy portion of Scripture to read this morning. Uh, not necessarily just trying to fill up time, but it covers a needed subject, I think, in these days that we want to deal with. There's an awful lot of uh, situational things that we're facing right now, especially presented to us because of the whole coronavirus thing. But I want us to focus on something here that I think is extremely important. So Matthew's Gospel, chapter number 6, if you let me begin reading in verse number 25. There's what the Bible says. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. It's not the life more than meat, the body than raiment. Behold, the fowls of the air, they, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself sufficient, unto the day is the evil thereof. I would call your attention back to verse 25, therefore. Verse 31, therefore. Verse 34, therefore. And I'd like to preach to you this morning on this thought, three, I'm only going to use these three, three therefores for the anxious. We are living in anxious stressful, worrisome days. And so I want to share some thoughts with you today. And I really do believe that as many of the pains and pressures and pitfalls that might be around us right now, you add to that the current problems that many of us are facing. A lot of people can let stress, anxiety, worry uh, get the best of them. And it can happen to the best of us. Whoever you may think as a Christian, I've reached a point in my Christian life that I'm no longer bothered by stress or anxiety or worry. And then something like these situations of these days hit you, and there you are, right back going through the same kind of words that everybody else does. The fact of the matter is, we've got to learn how to conquer these things, or they will conquer us. And so it's an important part that we need to think about. I was reading the other day, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the great Baptist preacher of England, said this, Anxiety does not empty tomorrow of its sorrows. But it only empties today of its strength. Another, it was actually given, the quote was ascribed to Vance Havner, who said this, worry is like a rocking chair. Worry, anxiety, it's like a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but it doesn't get you anywhere. And I think that's so true about it. So consider with me for a moment this morning, three therefores for the anxious. Let's pray. We'll get right into the message. Father, again, we thank you for your word. We ask for your divine guidance and help. May the Holy Spirit take the words that I say to people's ears and then implant them in their hearts. May your word find a deep, settled place in all of us and draw us ever closer to you. Save the lost, reclaim the backslider, and motivate, stir, and encourage your people. And we give you praise and honor and glory for all you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I remember as a boy, one of my boyhood heroes was Daniel Boone. I don't know if any of y'all would remember, but no doubt there's some in our audience that would remember the days when Fess Parker... Uh, the famous actor in many of the Disney movies played a TV series in which he played Daniel Boone. And I can still remember that song starting off, that Daniel Boone was a man. Yes, a big man. And it talks about, I can remember that little phrase from the coon skin cap on the top of old Dan to the heel of his rawhide shoe, the rippingest, roaringest fight man that the frontier ever knew. And so I can remember wanting a coonskin hat. I didn't want to go out and kill the coon, but I'd like to have a coonskin cap. I want to look a little bit, bit like Daniel Boone, go out into the wilderness, ply my way and pioneer through the uh, one acre of woods that might be behind my house. 
you know, just a real great person. But I can remember those days. I was reading some recently about Mr. Boone. He was in his 80s, and a fellow was painting his portrait. And he said to him, Mr. Boone, in all of your travels and all of your pioneer days of blazing those trails through the wilderness, did you ever get lost? He thought for a moment. He said, well, he said, no, I can't say that I ever was lost. But I was bewildered once for three days. And so I think that was kind of his way of saying this. It's what we feel sometimes. We might say I've never been lost. I've never been completely overwhelmed by worry, but I've been pretty bewildered, caught up with things. And that's what this passage is about. It's not about not thinking about stuff or caring about stuff or taking precautions about stuff or planning stuff. When Jesus says in those three verses where it says, therefore, verse 25, verse 31, verse 34, where he says, therefore, he also says this, take no thought. Does that mean we're just supposed to haphazardly go through life and never think about anything? And God forbid, I think or dwell on something. This verb, these verses are not about not caring or planning or taking precaution. It just simply means to not overly think about it, to not overly worry, to not go to the point of you're so involved in worrying about clothes and food and raiment, am I going to make it, am I going to survive, that those things, those thoughts dominate our life. We can't seek God's will, we don't seek His service, we don't worship Him like we should. We are so caught up with all the things that the Gentiles, in this case the heathen, if you will, folks outside of the family of God, we get as called up with those things as the world does. Now understand, it's a frustrating thing for me as a preacher and sometimes as a personal Christian to see how Christians are often as frustrated, worrisome, and anxious and about to fall apart, come apart in the scenes, as if they did not even know the Lord, they didn't have a heavenly father. But I'm glad to find this passage that reminds me we do have somebody to watch over us when we get anxious and worrisome and fretful and things scare us and terrify us or we get as Boone did a little bewildered. And so let me share with you some things and I think again the passage can be broken down using those three therefores and they deal with subjects that are extremely important to us. Number one, I'd have you notice in verse number 25, let me read it to you again. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, or yet for your body, what ye shall put on is not the life more than meat and the body that reigneth. Here is the substance of life. Notice he says at the end of the verse, is not the life more? I'm sure there's a lot of people out there, maybe listening to me, maybe outside the church doors that often think this. What is life about? What, what is there to life? Isn't life more than this? Some people seek after something all their life and achieve it and think that's all there is. They go through life, they go through ritual, they go through religion, they go through reform, they go through turning over a new leaf on life. They try a lot of stuff from the business world to recreation. And when they get everything they can get their hands on, they're still not satisfied. It's as if they're saying this, I got all the substance I could get out of life, all the gusto. I've tried everything and nothing brought me full satisfaction. Solomon is referenced in verse number 29, Solomon in all his glory. Now we know Solomon wrote the book of Proverbs, but he also wrote the book of Song of Solomon, and he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. And in that book, in Ecclesiastes, he basically says in chapter number two that he hated life. He had tried everything. He had reached out everything. He had got a hold of everything that he considered substantial in life. I've got wine, women, and song. He tried it all. He had riches. He had wealth. He had wisdom. Everything that you could gain in this world, he had all of it. And he said it's all vanity. He uses that word repeatedly in the book of Ecclesiastes. Vanity, 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 vanity. In other words, getting all that stuff is empty. And I believe Jesus is reminding us of this, that when we let worry, he gives us some information. When we let worry get the best of us, it robs us of what the real substance of life is all about. Is not your life more 
Listen to me. Uh, life is more than just going to church. Life is more than just going to work. Life is more than just raising a family. Life is more than earning a paycheck. There is more to life. By the way, Jesus didn't just promise us life. He promised us life and that more abundantly. Life now, abundant now, eternal now, and everlasting after this life. Notice what he says again in this verse. It's not the life more than meat and the body than raiment. And he uses a little bit of information he gives us. In verse 25, he uses the word or the phrase, your life. Then he uses the phrase, your body. And then in verse number 26, he uses the phrase, your heavenly father. I would submit that we don't have the real substance of life unless we grab a hold of the information in that. Your life, that's the first one. The Bible teaches in Colossians chapter number three, the Bible says this, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear. One of these days, the Lord Jesus is coming back. He is our life. I think sometimes as Christians, we forget that. Our life isn't just about us. It's supposed to be about Jesus and everything that revolves around his honor, his glory, and we, we invest our, this is the information the world needs. You can watch every press briefing you want to that President Trump gives. You can listen to every Democrat talk till they're blue in the face. You can listen to every friend that you've got on Facebook or the internet. You can talk to everybody you want to on the phone, and you get a lot of information, but none of it's going to help you near like what Jesus said about what life really is. It's not about all the circumstances and events. Life is more. Life is about a person, and that person is the Lord Jesus Christ. He uses that phrase also, your body. Now, obviously, we live in our bodies. We are body, soul, and spirit. We're a three-part individual, a trinity in ourselves. Our body on the outside, our soul and spirit on the inside. These things that make us conscious of both the world, of each other, and of God. These are all a part of who we are as an individual. But our bodies, we care about them. Obviously, now with the coronavirus, everybody's not worried about their soul being sick. Nobody's worried about how their spirit is faring. But everybody's worried that they might get some bodily disease called the coronavirus. And it's a horrible thing from what I hear. And a lot of people have gotten it. A lot of people have passed away. A lot of families have been devastated by it. I wouldn't make light of it at all. But I say this much. Many people are extremely concerned about the body without realizing what Jesus said, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on is not the, is not the life more than meat in the body than rain. In other words, there's, some, there's a bigger picture than just the body. You see, if we cure today, and I'm convinced, by the way, if Donald Trump came up with a cure for the coronavirus tomorrow, first thing tomorrow, and announced it on national television, all you got to do is take this pill and you'll be cured. The entire world of Democrats and everybody that hates him would throw him under the bus because they'd say he didn't do it in time or he didn't do it soon enough. So I'm just saying this much. If you found the cure and fixed the body, that would not repair the soul. It would not liven or revive the spirit of man. It would not save anybody. Life, the substance of life, is in Jesus Christ. It's more than our body. It's more than our clothes. It is a life that involves the next your, verse 26, your heavenly father. We leave him out of it. We've missed the main information. Earlier in this chapter, if you'll look back at verse number 8 and 9, Jesus says this, Be not ye therefore like unto them, that is the heathen who by vain repetitions just say things over and over again, for your father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. After this manner, therefore, pray ye. Here's the information we need. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That prayer that is given reminds us of the need of our Father to make up the substance of our life. If all you got is money and land and property and fun and recreation and stuff, you really don't have what life's all about. You have to know Jesus as your Savior, and you have to know our God in heaven, not just as a God up there, but as our and your heavenly Father. He gives the illustration to make this substance a little bit bigger for us so we can understand it better. And he uses the idea, first of all, of the fowls of the air, verse 26, the fowls of the air. Luke's gospel, he references them as ravens. Somehow God takes care of the millions of birds 
that fly in the atmosphere around this world. Now, can you imagine just having to feed the birds outside of your house every day? But imagine having to feed and provide and take care of them on the entire planet. And yet, if God, our Heavenly Father, can take care of them, He'd take care of us. So our life, the substance of it, is surely if God can take care of the birds, He can take care of us. He'll take care of what really matters. He also used the idea of a figure or an individual stature. In verse 27, what, which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? Now, when I was a boy, I tried that. I was probably, I guess, maybe 12 or 13 years of age. And uh, I was a big fan of comic books. And in one of these comic books, there was this thing about this uh, uh, chin-up bar. You could uh, order online, and I, I ordered it somehow. Mom and Daddy let me in. I ordered this chin-up bar, and you used it by twisting it. You put it in the door frame. You put that thing up there, and after putting that in place, you can do chin-ups with it. Well, I got this bright idea, and I read something else in the comic. That there were certain exercises you could do that could stretch your body. It's always been a little bit short. Basketball was my game, and I wanted to be taller. I wanted to be bigger. I wanted to be able to play that game better. And I can remember getting that thing in the mail and getting that, uh, pr uh, the paper that came with it that showed about some exercises to help lengthen my physique. And I remember it. you're supposed to put the bar the chin-up bar in the door frame, and then hang on. And you just hang on that for, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes. And then you get upside down and put your feet on. And then you hang upside down. And then if you put it on the floor, you're just supposed to stretch. Ah, you just stretch as far as you can up and as far as you can down. Do all that stretching you can. Well, I don't know, after about two weeks, I had not grown any, but I, with my hands, I could reach down and stretch my ankles. I could not even have to bend over. I mean, I stretched my arms. I probably stretched my neck. I probably stretched uh, mom and daddy's patience during those days, but it didn't do me a lick of good. I'm still short after all these days. Just look at my wallet. You can tell I'm short. I'm short a dollar here and a dollar there. But the fact of the matter is, I, by taking thought, I cannot add one cubit. Now, a cubit is roughly from the elbow to the end of the middle finger. In a normal sized person, that's roughly 18 inches. A larger person, it might be up to 22. That's the framework from which you get most of it, 18 to 22 inches. Who, by taking thought. Now, I know you ladies are thinking this. When I put on my high heels, I'm six inches tall. Well, you may be, but you haven't added to your stature. Your body itself has not grown. We have not gotten taller. Now, we can all get bigger in other ways. But we can increase our height. I'm sitting here thinking, I want to be taller, want to be taller, want to be taller. Worrying myself sick about it. And somehow I'm going to grow at uh, 18 inches a foot and a half. It's not going to happen. How foolish it is. God makes us the way we are, whether we're short or tall or uh, whatever our size may be. God takes care of all of that. There's no need to worry about stuff that's not going to happen. In verse number 28, he also adds the idea of the lilies of the field. So he goes from the fowls of the air to the figure of our bodies to the flowers that are there. And the, could the, consider the lilies in verse 28, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory is not arrayed like one of these. If God can, it's just as simple. This is the substance of life. Our life is, is more than food and more than raiment. It's more than the stuff out there. It's wrapped up and tied to our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and to our Heavenly Father. And furthermore, when you consider the flowers and you consider the birds and you consider our stature and our trying to make ourselves be what we cannot, it all comes down to this. You can trust God to take care of every area of your life in the areas which you think are important are not as important as the ones that He will provide and take care of for you. The substance of life involves these things real easy. The life is more than the stuff that there is out there. A second word that comes to my mind as I look at this, when I get to verse 31, there is that therefore. And often we have said this, whenever you see the word therefore in the Bible, look and see what it's there for. Therefore, verse 31, take no thoughts in what shall we eat or what shall we drink or wherewithal shall we be clothed for all. After all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. The second word comes to my mind is the stress of things. I ran across this recently in a book by Herbert Lockyer entitled The Sins of the Saints. 
And one of those sins he calls attention to is the sin of worry, over worrying about stuff. And he quotes a University of Wisconsin study in which they gave different causes of people that were worrying. 40% of our worries, the study said, are over things that never happen. 30% of our worries are over things that have already happened and passed, and no amount of worry could ever change it, what has already occurred. 10% are petty worries, things that don't matter. 12% are needless health worries, but also stated was that 8% of the things that we worry about are real and legitimate. So only 8% really need our time and attention. What this means is that the stress of worry and anxiety, fear, fretting, frustration, all these things that tend to grow and develop in days like we're living in, the valleys, the trials that we we'll sang about earlier, puts on sometimes some physically destructive consequences. In a book by Dr. S.I. McMillan entitled None of These Diseases, he's got a chapter called Upset Mind and a Sick Body. And here's what he said. Listen to this about the physical problems that worry, the stress of it can do. It can present disorders of the digestive system, disorders of the circulatory system, disorders of the nervous system, allergic disorders, muscle joint disorders, infections, eye diseases, skin diseases. He goes on to write this, the office of a physician is filled with people suffering from nearly every disease in the book because their minds are beset by a thousand worries about their finances, their health, and their children. And I just park here for a minute and say this much. If the world that does not know Jesus as their Savior, they don't have a Heavenly Father, they are the Gentiles referred to in verse number 32, the world of the heathen who have no knowledge of God. If some of those people can cope with the situation, surely God's people can cope. If they can deal with it, we can deal with it. It's sad, but we can watch people on talk shows seemingly handle it better than the average church member on our pews. Our problem is not that we're weak people. The problem is that we're not trusting God. We're not leaning on Him. In the times when we need Him the most, we want somebody to fix the problem. Give us, and I, again, we all benefited from the stimulus check, but that's not the cure for everything. Give me a check, give me this, take care of this. Oh, with the government, please rescue us. No, our trust ought not to be in the government. Our trust is not in Trump, and our trust is not even in each other or in ourselves. Our trust ought to be in the Lord. Worry is physically destructive. Some of you have got physical problems because you worry, literally, you worry yourself sick about some stuff that ain't never going to happen. Others of you worry yourself sicker with a little bit of sickness you've got. If you sneeze, you're worried you got the coronavirus. If you cough, you're worried you're going to die. You've got to stop doing that because it will eventually, it will conquer you if you don't conquer it. But this stress is more than physically destructive. It also is spiritual and depleting. Listen, worry will suck the life right out of you. Yeah. It will rob you of joy. Somebody said it this way, worry affects us in many ways. Spiritually, it weakens our desire for prayer and spending time in God's Word. It beclouds our spiritual vision. It takes us out of Christian service. It takes our eyes off of God and it even hinders our worship. And I'm not just talking about corporate worship. Gathering together in church, we already know the stress of this mess going on now has kept us out of church. But I would submit to you this, that many of us, both myself and you that are listening included, many of us has let this thing get us a little bit off track. We don't read our Bible like we ought to, not pray like we should. We're just kind of going through the motions and just wait for this thing to be over with. And we're drifting or coasting rather than taking the steps that we need to take or leading or going in a specific direction. I still say that what Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths is still good advice in this day. Now, let me move on and say this. In regard to the stress, and I don't want to spend too much time just talking about the stress itself. We've seen what it can do to you physically. We've seen what it can do to you spiritually. But I don't think that's the point of the passage. 
I don't think this passage is about rescuing us from what might be sucking the life out of us or robbing us or discouraging us. But rather, I think it's about this. It's how we act when the stress comes. The stress is going to hit everybody in the world. It rains on the just and the unjust. This is not some disease that Satan cooked up just to attack Christians and lost people don't get it. Everybody gets this disease. Everybody faces this problem in every uh, area of life. But I believe what Jesus is saying in this passage is how do you deal with the stress? How do you deal with the worry? How do you deal with the frustration? And there are several ideas here. I think one of the ways we deal with it, sometimes I'm afraid, is we deal foolishly with it. We act like the Gentiles. We worry ourselves as sick as if we did not know the Lord or we did not have his word or we did not have each other. Think about all the benefits and all the wonderful things God gives us. Now, we might not be able to worship together, but y'all can still stay in touch by Facebook, and you do. I've even gone on there and done it and been encouraged. Some of you stay in touch by way of a phone or by way of texting. Or maybe you see one another and you keep your six-foot distance. Or maybe you're just around family. You see, those are things God's given us to encourage us when these times happen. They're already there. We just don't pay attention to them. And maybe all of this not being able to do what we want to do, watch what we want to watch, maybe it's given us just a little bit of a pause, a little bit of a hold in just a minute. And look at the things God's given you. I would say this much to you. The Word of God is no less powerful now than it was six months ago. Yeah. Prayer is no less vital in our life than it was six years ago. And the fellowship that we get from the people we know, even if it's just a phone call, even if it's just a text, even if it's just something on Facebook, somebody sends us something in email, whatever it may be, those are things we're foolish if we don't let those things help us. It's how we act under the stress. But I would also say this, we could be faithless. Notice the end of verse number 30. He said, Oh, ye of little faith. I'm afraid sometimes when things like this happen, we get worried, not just about this, but just about other things. And somebody might be worried about a paycheck. You might be worried about how you're going to keep your house. You might be worried about how you're going to make your next about the disease getting you. Whatever's worrying you, whatever's troubling you, We've got to still keep our faith in God. We have to trust the Lord. Now, that's a lot easier to say it than it is to do it. It's easy preaching. It's hard living. But you've got to trust the Lord. We can react foolishly. We can act faithlessly. Or we can act fatherlessly. You did notice that he mentions Heavenly Father in verse number 26. Your Heavenly Father. In verse number 32. Your Heavenly Father. Shame on us. If we act like we don't have a heavenly father. He knows what we have need of and he'll provide it. He took care of the birds. He took care of the flowers. He took care of our stature. He takes care of our lives. He will continue to take care of us. The third and final thing I want to call your attention to in this passage. The third therefore is in verse number 34. And here is what I would call the selection of life. Now to get this, remember we look at therefore and see what it's there for. So we got to back up to verse number 33. But seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore because of the choice you made to seek first the kingdom of God. I'm afraid that sometimes we overlook that principle. We're worrying more than we're seeking the Lord and his will and his kingdom first. Seek ye first. So that's not just a principle to live by. It's a priority. Seek ye first. Right now, other things are first. We're worried. I am. You are. We all get worried. We get bogged down in the worry of it. What's in front of us seeking God and his kingdom. But there is also a person. This is not just a kingdom. It's the kingdom of God. And nobody gets in the kingdom of God except by being born again through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. What I'm getting at is this. If you're going to conquer worry and fret and anxiety, we all have to fight it. It's not like it goes away one time forever. Every time it comes back up, we got to do this. We have to make a choice. I'm not going to let worry get the best of me. Anxiety may bother me, but it ain't whooping me. By the grace of God and with my trust in the Lord and a heavenly Father that knows what I need, who provides everything, he takes care of the birds, he's going to take care of me. 
He takes care of the flowers. He's going to take care of me. He took care of me all this time. And he, listen, we too far down the road turn back now. God is going to continue to take care of me. Yeah. But you know what? Maybe we're like the little poem that said this. Said the robin to the sparrow. I should really like to know why these anxious human beings rush around and worry so. Said the sparrow to the robin, friend, I think that it must be that they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. We need to remember this. You and I, if we're saved, we have a heavenly father. But you still get burdened. You still have things that trouble you and get on to you. And if I could close with this thought right here, as prone as we are to worry, have you ever thought about taking that burden to the Lord and leaving it there? That song was written by Charles Tinley, who died in 1933. He was a popular Methodist preacher who preached on occasion to 10,000 people. His church could not even hold all of the members and visitors who came to hear him preach. And because of his stature, he once wished to be a bishop in the Methodist church, but they turned him down at one of their big conferences. They turned him down because he had never graduated from high school. Someone had actually laid a claim against immoral activity. He did not even get a chance at the conference where he was hoping to be elected a bishop. He did not even get a chance to lay his defense out for what he'd been accused of. Well, when he got back home, he was so under the weather, so torn up by worry and anxiety and the burden of all of it. He was just so discouraged. And his wife encouraged him by reminding him of a message he preached in which he had said that Jesus had helped the disciples through the storm from one side all the way to the other. And then during that bitter experience that he faced, worrying about why this had not occurred and what was he going to do now, he sat down and wrote these words. If the world from you withhold of its silver and its gold, and you have to get along with meager fare, just remember in his word how he feeds a little bird. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. Leave it there, leave it there. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. If you trust and never doubt, he will surely bring you out. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. So if today you're burdened down with worry and anxiety, take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. Maybe you're listening today and you're not saved. You don't know Christ as your Savior. You do not have a heavenly Father. I invite you to put your faith and trust in Jesus. Call on him for the forgiveness of your sins. To come into your heart and save you and change your life. And if you're a Christian burdened, Take that burden of worry to the Lord and leave it there. Your heavenly Father will take care of you. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. Bless it to the hearts and lives of your people. Save the lost. Again, reclaim the backslider. Encourage the hearts of your people. And we give you glory for all you do. In Jesus' name and for his sake we pray. Amen.